Okay, thanks so much uh, for inviting me here. I attended a conference uh, organized by Ferry Olmos uh, a week ago in London on discourse, politics, uh, populism, and all that. Um, I thought, oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, I've already prepared a presentation for this event, and, um, and so I went and, um, and saw the nice people. And, um, and then I realized, oh, it's, it's the same people. So, um, um, well, I tried to do something slightly different, the same theoretical argument with um, different material, and I hope you forgive me if, if I don't um, do exactly uh, the same thing. Um, I should say I have a background in science and technology studies. Um, as you may know, science and technology studies um, tries to uncover the social construction in scientific knowledge. Um, and to cut a very long story very short, um, there has been a movement in, in this field from kind of showing the social mechanisms and practices um, in, in the construction of wrong knowledge, that is, for example, there's the idea the earth is flat, and then there are all kinds of institutions, power relationships, and all that that we can show to, to understand why such an idea can can get a hold in society. And over time, um, that idea has been extended to knowledge which has been um, recognized as true as well. I mean, like um, law of gravity and things like that, um, or that there are planets um, circling around each other. And, um, and so um, the whole idea that there's not only the social construction of false knowledges, but also of true knowledges, is the very um, idea of the so-called strong program in science and technology studies, which has been around for quite a long time now. Um, it's from the 70s, from David Bloor, the so-called Edinburgh School. And uh, basically, the idea is that um, in order to account for the social making of knowledges, um, it, is, it is important to, to apply the principle of symmetry. That is, if we have an account, a social account, for example, of um, knowledges, it should apply to the false and the true knowledges um, in the same way. And, and that's an idea, I think, that is quite helpful for some of the problems we have in discourse studies. Um, I mean, it's a classic to deconstruct the lies of Trump, for example, and to show the power mechanisms and the distribution of resources and all that um, that helps these fake news um, spread around the world. Um, if, if we uncover these, these social mechanisms, of course, uh, we don't only unmake certain truth claims um, in Trump, but we also contribute to making some truth claims of our own. So there's also there's always this kind of tension between various truth claims and our own truth claims, which are, I mean, of course, true for us. Um, they're also socially made. That's the kind of gist of the strong program. If we look at um, at knowledges and how they're made and unmade in this course, we we not only look to to the wrong knowledge, but also to to the true knowledge that is our own knowledge. And if we uncover that, um, that, that both are socially made. This doesn't make our claims weaker, but on the contrary, it's very important. Um, it, it, it makes it more consistent and thus stronger. And that's why it's a strong program. Um, in the following, I will apply this insight to, well, some of the questions that, um, that we deal with here. Um, namely to populist discourse and academic discourse. And I'll try to match both and show that, um, well, there are certain things that we can learn from both. Let me um, look into some social media analysis of um, populist discourse. Um, I'll show you some slides about the concentration of, um, well, visibility. Um, in, in tweeting practices. And uh, here you'll find a representation of the 500 most important media outlets as they're retweeted um, in, in, in social media. And you can see in this analysis, of course, that um, there are some media outlets which are 
hugely dominant. Um, Sorry. What you are seeing is not what we are seeing. Oh, God knows that why. Is, that is interesting. I've never had that. No, it's true. This is actually moving. Where is my friend Diana? He's not here. <laughs> that <laughs> I, I knew this is what I That's said, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's actually moving here, but it's not moving on the screen. participatory kind of reflection on... Either it's stuck or... <laughs> Can we just open it again? Maybe? Okay, yeah. yeah. Wait, where is it? Where is it? Here? Okay. Now we have nothing. We need to open the presentation, I suppose. This is... Ah, is it really? Yeah, okay, no, it's no. working. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that was the first slide that you missed, and now I was starting to to talk about this slide, which represents um, the presence of media outlets, the five hundred most dominant uh, important media outlets in Twitter. Um, I think this is an analysis from from uh, two thousand sixteen. And uh, what we see is we find a few media outlets which are hugely important. Um, and it's maybe not a big surprise that we have stuff like CNN, New York Times, um, Washington Post. You see a, a lot more other uh, little media outlets around. And they're so small, I can't even decipher the names. Um, there's also uh, one media outlet, which is very interesting. I think it's Breitbart um, here on the right. And basically, on the right, um, most of the Twitter activity on the right has been around Breitbart. And this shows um, a few things which are quite uh, remarkable. One thing is, um, well, um, there's no real big media outlet for the conservative right anymore. Um, but um, the whole right space is basically monopolized by Breitbart in Twitter, which is quite... Um, interesting. Um, the other thing is um, the so-called liberal cent centrist um, media outlets have become quite important in fact over the last two or three years. Um, the so-called failing New York Times in fact has doubled the number of subscribers. Um, and of course the last thing and that's really the important thing here, um, we see a very strong concentration of media visibility in, in very few media outlets. If we go to the next slide, um, here is an analysis of um, interaction activity for US politicians. And what you can see here, of course, is that uh, one politician has really monopolized attention over the last uh, few months, and this is Donald Trump. And um, and then if you go, go um, down the list, uh, there are also some very interesting remarks to be made. Uh, one thing, of course, is that the next most important um, personality is uh, Ocasio-Cortez, um, which is also, of course, I mean, seen as a kind of new generation of populist leaders in, in some way. And, um, and then, I mean, another interesting thing is, I mean, it's maybe scary to see that Donald Trump is so important in terms of likes and um, retweets in Twitter, but there's no other right-wing politician in the list. So he has more than all the others, but there's no other um, politician who, who does that kind of, um, who has this kind of visibility, except perhaps of Sean Hannity, who is a right-wing radio host, um, uh, very much uh, on, 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 at the end. And the others are mostly kind of democratic, liberal centrist um, politicians. Um, political figures, and um, and we also see that there's a strong dominance here um, for political personalities over uh, uh, media outlets, right? So <coughs> CNN, um, The Hill, ABC are much much smaller in terms of uh, Twitter visibility than than people like um, Donald Trump or AOC. Um, now that of course raises a few questions about how this is possible. It certainly doesn't reflect the ideas behind. I mean, it's not that uh, these 40 million people having liked Donald Trump really like Donald Trump. That's that's for certain. Um, it also raises the question. I mean, 
I mean, we can see in in the mapping of, of, of the media outlets that, of course, is re reflects certain resources. I mean, political economic power. Here, it's not so much about economic power. There must be some some sort of activity that some people uh, with these steward accounts um, can capture much better than others. So I think we should really um, talk about the way that certain um, actors in, in the media sphere can capture um, the activities of the discursive practices of so many other people. So this reflects not only um, the economic resources that they have. Of course, Donald Trump is a rich man, but I mean, we know he's not exactly the most established um, uh, political personality. Let me go to the last slide here. And um, this is a bit more complex. It's from 300,000 um, tweets um, around the Brexit debate. Um, and I mean, if we had a closer look, what it shows in a way is the relationship between these media outlets and personalities. And um, I mean, to try to make sense of, 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 of this cloud, we see on the right Tory um, leaning outlets and, um, and MPs, political people. And on the left, we see uh, the more kind of Remain and um, labor leaning um, outlets and then people. And what we see on the left is uh, a very strong dominance of the media outlets and some political personalities. And on the right, we see um, a strong dominance of, um, of, of the Brexit pro uh, uh, propagandists and some media outlets. Which um, I think is, is quite interesting because it seems that through um, the media activity on, on Twitter, um, right-wing people, right-wing populists, uh, can gain a lot of traction and, and recognition, visibility, and left-leaning media outlets. But you see very few people um, from the left-leaning political spectrum who are kind of recognized on Twitter that much. And interestingly enough, I mean, the right-leaning um, uh, conservative um, Twitter um, media outlets um, higher. So um, probably this is one of the reasons why, I mean, so many political figures have seen some sort of traction towards uh, Brexit. It really kind of helps them establish their subject position. And it's very difficult for people who do not represent the Brexit side to um, be present as political personalities. Okay, so this is um, one uh, kind of short and dirty um, analysis of uh, populism in, 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 in the media age. And what I now want to do is I want to turn to um, applied linguistics. Applied linguistics is the field where you find the most positions in discourse studies, which you may not be aware of, but there's a job market which is um, quite uh, established. It's been around for 30, 40 years. And, um, and if, if you want to um, apply for professorships of discourse, you better go to applied linguistics. And um, it's a field which studies language as a social practice. Um, most of the practitioners uh, work on language testing and teaching. And, um, and of course, um, there are lots of uh, discourse analysts and uh, people working in certain social arenas. Um, what we did in our ERC project is to um, study professors and their online presentations in linguistics and sociology. And what I did here is to collect all professors in three countries, France, Germany, and the UK, and to look into um, how their citations are distributed um, in, in the academic sphere. And um, we found 87 professors in applied linguistics in the three countries. And, and what I did here is on the right, I, I created tiers of citations for, for these 87 professors. And you see where people are situated um, in the citation kind of um, hierarchies um, according to language. Because, of course, I mean, in Germany and France, the vast majority of people um, um, publish in German and French, uh, even though in, in Germany you have quite a few people doing that in, in English as well. Um, and, um, and this, of course, creates uh, big differences in terms of how people are recognized as academics. And what we can see is there are few people, about 13, 
um, 13 professors who are cited perhaps less than 100 times, according to Google Scholar, which of course raises a lot of questions. And, and we don't have the time here to, to go into the limits of, of the methodology. Um, and there are some people who are cited extremely much, I mean, like over 10,000 times. And the most cited one, by the way, is a German. Um, and if we count all the citations together, about 10%, uh, that is nine of the 87 professors, are cited more than all the other professors, which is um, 100,000 times for the nine most cited professors and 70,000 um, uh, citations for the, for the other professors. Um, which, of course, is, um, um, is quite interesting because we can again ask, I mean, does this reflect a certain distribution of resources? Um, difficult um, to, to, to claim that. I mean, it's certainly the capacity to attract um, the discursive activity of so many people in the field, which include, of course, not only professors. And um, what we can say is that um, the hyper inequalities in applied linguistics, which we'll find in, in other fields as well, which, um, well, which raises the question of how to count these, um, these inequalities. Um, what I'd like to finish with is um, a plea to, to see the kind of symmetry in the making of hyper inequalities in the media sphere and in academic discourse. Um, in fact, <coughs> the challenge is to, to think about the inequalities that um, are constructed through the discursive practices of so many people in large, in large populations. And um, we have, um, of course, um, the capacity, which is highly une unequal, um, to attract um, the, the, the attention, the visibility of so many people participating in these games. And this is something we should account uh, for in terms of inequality and not in terms of the inherent quality of the ideas, which can be kind of heard and which are given some, some form in, in these um, spaces. So. Um, what I'd like to, to point out, of course, is that truths are made socially through these discursive practices where lots of people are involved in dynamics which nobody really controls totally, even though the resources are important, but untruths as well. And now I want to finish with one tricky thing, uh, because, of course, if we want to intervene as scientists, discourse analysts in in these discourses, which are of great importance uh, for us as citizens um, about populism and all that. Of course, we can do so only by occupying a certain subject position, which is socially ma made. So um, it really makes a difference um, if you come from a subject position, which, which is important. But you can't uh, participate in the game without reproducing the very same structures that we are better um, to reflect uh, critically and perhaps also to undo if we can. And that's how I want to um, close my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>